Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. It's good to be back here at all. I think the last few times that I've supplied prior to Brother Bill coming and being with y'all, I had to do that twice. So I, I see I hadn't forgotten things about you, but I'm glad I'm thankful to be here. It's a, always a joy to come and be among y'all, and uh, y'all have a special place in my heart. I thought after you know y'all were some of the first who gave me opportunity to speak, and I so the Lord blessed through that. I had a comment here. Where was I? Go, what was I going to say? Psalm 283. I need the prayers of, of those I love. I need y'all's prayers this morning. Y'all know that. Y'all have already been in prayer. So I, I, my, my desire is that you continue as the Lord leads me in, in the things that I might have to say. So if you would, uh, I, I, I've got to the habit of praying before I read my scripture text. So if... if this is time for that. So if y'all will pray. Lord God, our Father, as I have prayed already this morning, I ask for your presence, Lord, because you're the one who gives all life. You've given us a soul and a spirit. And Father, we just desire that our spirits might become stronger and closer to you. So Father, I ask your blessings upon the study that I've made. Bless your blessings that I might be able to say the words that will glorify thy precious and holy name this morning. So lead us, O Lord. And Father, I ask that the ears and the hearts might be opened among these who are gathered here. That if something is good is said, that, that they might be attentive to. So Father, I would pray for them. I pray for all who are on our prayer list. Ask, Lord, that you bless those according to their need, Father, whether that need be of the body, mind, or spirit. So help us, Lord, that we might ever glorify thee, and that we might always pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And amen. Well, this morning we're going to look, Lord willing, at 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, I'm going to read the first 12 verses. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According to as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Wherefore, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. For so an entrance, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be diligent, 
you. Wherefore, I will not be diligent, negligent to put you always in the remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. As I began preparing for this message, uh, after reading and uh, trying to understand what the Lord would have me to bring, it was my intent. Notice how I said that. It was my intent to focus on verse 11 about making our calling and election sure. But as I continued to read these verses, I realized, or rather I remember, Verse 11 doesn't stand alone. And not only does verse 11 not stand alone, none of the scriptures stand alone. They are all, all intertwined. Sometimes it takes more study for others than, to understand that than, than some. I had to be reminded of it. But the understanding of these verses Somewhat, or verse, understanding of verse 11 somewhat depends on what's said about it before and a little bit after of what comes after it. So my initial focus, verse 11, well, I'm not so focused on it now. Now, before we get into the meat of the, of the text, I feel it's important that we understand who is writing this epistle under the leadership of the Holy Ghost. We look at verse 1 of our text. We see who is writing, and we see to whom it is written. And then we jump down to verse 12, and it tells us why it was written. Now, the identity of the writer is, is evident. evident. It's the apostle Peter. But exactly to whom he is uh, immediately writing is less clear. He does not seem to be addressing any particular church, such as Ephesus or, or Corinth and, or, or some of the others, as, as uh, Paul does. Peter only identifies them as, quote, them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Now, I wanted to get more specific. I wanted to give you a little more uh, identity concerning these people. And to do that, we have to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. And he's a little more specific there, but he's, it's still a little vague. So he was uh, in chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 Peter, he writes, To the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, who are these people that are scattered? As I understand it, Peter is writing to those Christian Jews who have been scattered unto these strange lands by the persecution in Jerusalem and Judea. And by continuance, these scriptures are to God's elect down through the ages as we travel through this strange land. Yes, we are traveling through a strange land. Now, why is Peter right? Verse 12. In verse 12, Peter reminds them, he calls on them to remember the truths which they had been taught and which had already been established in, the, in their minds. It's Peter's desire to, by this letter, stir up their minds and their memories of these truths. As he is writing from prison, he can't go to them. He's in prison in Rome. And he understands that his death is near. And he feels like, if I don't write to these people, if I don't communicate with them in some way, I'm going to be negligent in my calling. I'm going to be negligent in my service to them and negligent to Christ. Since he says, I can't fail to do this. I write this letter. Now, I shared the identities of these, or when I shared these identities uh, of those to whom Peter wrote, I, I basically I've cut the identity short a little bit. But I want to look at a little bit more detail. Uh, if you want to follow with me, uh, put your fingers there at, at, 
at verse 1 of our text and turn back one chapter or, or one book back to 1 Peter 1. And I want to read those two verses combined. I'm going to start with 1 Peter 1, 1 and read continuous into uh, 1 Peter 1, 2 Peter 1 and 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So the, the precious faith that we are talking about here, we see that Peter, uh, Peter is telling us how it's obtained. He says, it's not obtained of ourselves. He says, that faith, that like precious faith, comes through the righteousness of our Savior Jesus Christ. When we get to verse 2, though, Peter is praying that through their knowledge of Jesus Christ, that grace, not that, not that saving grace that they already have, but he's praying that a grace for peace and peace for living will be bestowed upon them that they might live through the influence of saving grace, that they might grow in their faith. Then we turn to verses 3 and 4. Peter's still reminding them of the power through which they receive grace and knowledge. Then 5 and 7, 5 through 7. They receive instruction. We receive instruction. In fact, not only are we given instruction, we are given an assignment. Why is that assignment there? That we might grow in our faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then it's so uh, in, in these verses, uh, the second, well, it's actually the first commandment that he gives. He says, giving all diligence. So this is what he's saying. You be diligent in this assignment. I want to reread verses 5 through 7. Of the and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, through Christ, we have received saving grace. And we've received these graces that we need to live and, and follow after him. But what he's calling for us to do at this point is to strengthen our faith through exercising these these other uh, these, these things that we've just talked spread about. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Philippi, told them something somewhat similar. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. They are to add to their faith. They are to work it out. They are to strengthen it. Now this list in 2 Peter, I've heard them called Christian graces. And these graces, and we're to strengthen these graces that we might increase their use in our faith. We received them through the new birth. And when we use, he uses the word add in this case, it says that these graces need to be fed. They need to be exercised. They need to be nourished in order to grow and in order to be seen within us to the praise of Jesus Christ. Lord willing, I'd like to now look at these very briefly, individually. So starting with virtue. Virtue is in moral courage or intestinal fortitude, which enables us to profess our faith in the Lord before men, whether it be in times of peace or in times of tribulation. 
It allows us to stand up for what is right in the sight of God. Knowledge. In this case, I believe it's speaking about the understanding of the scriptures, which we know that the scriptures are true wisdom. And the knowledge that we find there is one of the footings on which our faith and the use of our virtue is preserved. Temperance. The best way to say this is that temperance is the keeping of our minds, the keeping of our bodies in submission. <clears throat> it's not allowing ourselves to fall away back into the ways that we formerly lived, falling back onto the ways of the world. Patience. Patience is withstanding the evils and temptations and wisdom of the world. It's us enduring whatever comes before us with the mind of Christ. Patience allows and enables us to persevere through any trial, through any temptation, with humility and love. Godliness. Godliness is joyfully submitting to and, and bowing before God in, in, in piety and with a reverential fear. But this is not a, not a show or an outward show to impress men. The thought there turns me to the Pharisee in the parable of the publican and the Pharisee where he made that show. But instead, it's a personal, I'll use the word demonstration, of adoration and love for God coming from within, coming from the, the heart, the soul, and the mind. Jesus made reference to this in, in Mark 12, 30 and 31. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. <clears throat> so that second verse, verse 31, well, it sent me right back to the next of these living graces. It says, love thy neighbor. What is, what is it taught? Where is it leading back to? It leads back to brotherly kindness. And this is a necessary grace for individuals toward each other within the church. It speaks not only of good wishes toward the brethren, but it also speaks of our activity within the church. It's desiring good toward each other, but it's also doing good toward each other. There's a difference. Couldn't help but go to James in this situation where he says, a man say, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me. James must have been from Missouri. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. He had a lot to say about words of action before he got to this. But the last of these graces is charity. And I believe that charity is inclusive of brotherly kindness. For brotherly kindness, again, is a demonstration of love within the local church, quote unquote, whatever we may deem to be the local church. But our charity, our love is to extend well beyond the scope of the local church. I want to quote Matthew Henry. This is what he says about charity. Charity or love of goodwill to all mankind must be added to the love of delight which we have for those who are the children of God. God has made of one blood all nations 
and all the children of men are partakers of the same human nature, are, are all, excuse me, are all capable of the same mercies and liable to the same afflictions, and therefore, through us upon a spiritual account, Christians are distinguished and dignified above those who are without Christ. Yet they, many Christians, are to sympathize with others in their calamities and to relieve their necessities and promote their, their welfare both in body and soul as they have opportunity. Thus most all believers in Christ evidence that they are the children of God who is good to all, but especially to Israel, end quote. And Israel there meaning the whole family of God rather than the nation. So we come back to that word diligence. We are to be diligent in adding these graces, in, 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 in growing these graces because it will make us fruitful in our knowledge and in our service to the Lord. And this is what Peter says in verse 8. He says, add these things. He says, for if these things be in you and abound, they, sh they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we look at verse 9. Kind of turns around his word. We see what coldness and what inattention to these graces will result in. It speaks of falling away. We only have to reference uh, King David. We know that David had an instance of falling away. And in Psalm 51, he wrote that he had lost the joy of his salvation. And if we are cold and inattentive to these graces. We, just as he, can lose that joy of our salvation. We will never lose our salvation, but we can lose the joy of it. And then verse 10 begins with word, wherefore. Peter's reminding us, he says, consider what you have been taught. Now consider what you have been reminded of. Think back what I've taught you previously and what I'm teaching you here. He says, in doing these things, you assure yourselves of God's calling and election. And in doing them in true Christmas, Christian faith, you are giving evidence of your calling and election. So diligence, our diligence in adding these Christian graces will keep us from backsliding into our former lives of darkness and as David, losing our jo the joy of our salvation. Now looking at verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In this verse, Peter is he's trying to assure and comfort those who have received that light, precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The beloved, without that, that light, precious faith, neither they that he's writing to immediately, nor can we exercise these Christian graces because there would be nothing to us. But, but because of God's saving grace, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, these living graces, <coughs> these living graces are attainable goals. These are goals that we to reach for and, and, and run the race toward. For Paul in Romans 8 and 28, excuse me, Romans 8, 29 and 30 tells us. Whom he did foreknow. Who did he foreknow? Those who had that like precious faith. He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. 
conform to the image of Christ. Christ had these graces. We're to grow in our great these graces that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he called, also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Beloved, when we're glorified, looking at that last section, we will have had that entrance into the everlasting kingdom ministered unto us. But we're not there yet. Therefore, as we remain here in the earth, I need to be diligent. You need to be diligent. Why do we need to be diligent? Because we are the elect called children of God. We are need to be following these teachings. We need to be doing these teachings. We need to be growing in these teachings. In these Christian graces. Why? That the world might know that we know Jesus. Why? Because these evidences of our salvation, these are evidences of our salvation. So let's give thanks to the Lord that He inspired Peter to record these words that we might know that there's work for us to do even though we already have our salvation through grace. Did this end up exactly like I planned out to start with? No, it doesn't matter. I follow and help what the Lord wanted, I feel like what the Lord wanted to say this morning. So I say, I'll close with this. Lord bless you, love you, look forward to being with y'all again. Sometime. <laughs> so God bless. Thank you. As we sing our closing hymn, I would now announce the open door of the church. And if there any be here who would like to unite with this church, professing their love of Jesus Christ, that invitation is open to you.